NASA clearly needs a replacement for the retired space shuttles in the Space Transportation System, also known as STS. As a system, the space shuttles were genuine workhorses. Expensive, yes, at about $775 million per launch, but it was also powerful, capable of lifting 30 tons into space, and it was largely reusable. It also had a reasonable turnaround time for relaunch. One shuttle cost $1.75 billion to build, so reusability was an important feature. All told, the STS launched 134 times, with 852 people on board from 16 different countries, spending more than three and a half years in space. Although two of the six shuttles failed, on the whole, it was a successful program. And, of course, there were many astronauts that were on several flights, so there were 355 flyers in total, 306 men and 49 women. Since 2011, NASA has spent $1.5 billion per year on developing the new Space Launch System, also known as SLS, the Space Transportation System Replacement. Relations were acceptable with Russia at the time, so the U.S. buying space from Roscosmos to get people to and from the International Space Station was fine. It benefited Roscosmos because they are always struggling for state financing, and the U.S. got more research time to get a replacement rocket system built. The lion's share of the $23 billion invested so far has gone to the prime contractor, Boeing, but the whole process has been a disappointment from the beginning. It was on track and supposed to be ready to launch by the end of 2016. But NASA's policy, which was forced upon them by Congress, obliged them to work with existing partners of NASA and to agree to a price with the contractor, specifically with a plus any additional cost clause in the contract. This allows zero contractors to have problems or experience delays because they get more money with almost no oversight. With so many people contracted to build the new space launch system, it's inevitable that there will be difficulties that generate more money for those contractors. NASA Inspector General Paul Martin pointed out that Boeing was still paid a handsome bonus for their continued incompetence. Influential senators making these decisions don't care, however, because the extra money directly benefits companies in their constituencies. Of course, it's not just the contractors. Congress approved the SLS funding, stipulating a 70 to 100 ton payload capacity. They then added specifications to assure that it could also safely launch the new crew capsule Orion, and then further up the payload requirement to 130 tons. Every change causes delays, wastes money already spent, and costs more to implement. Perhaps you remember the old cautionary joke that an elephant is just a mouse designed by committee. The timetable has lengthened, the cost has ballooned, and by the looks of things in 2022, each launch will cost more than $4 billion, or nearly $60,000 per kilogram. Although a small company at the time, having only three launches of Falcon 9 under its belt, media hype was building as SpaceX worked towards the Falcon X, the Falcon X Heavy, and the Falcon Double X. Unlike anything since the Saturn V launched Skylab and took the astronauts to the moon with a payload of 140 tons, SpaceX's new design was completely reusable and was proposed to lift 100 tons. Starship will be just a bit taller at 118 meters on the launch pad. The Saturn V rocket was 111 meters tall, but had 40% more payload capacity. A lot of people, including Musk, weren't fooled by the public relations reporting. SLS was getting prohibitively expensive. What people didn't know at the time was that Musk had a plan with a radically different approach. His ultimate goal was a 122-meter, reusable rocket capable of carrying 300 tons. This was to be the basis of SpaceX's interplanetary transportation system. Since he had just seen the first firing of the company's new engine, Raptor, the previous day, Musk announced the interplanetary transportation system at the 67th International Astronautical Congress. The ITS name evolved briefly into BFR, or Big Falcon Rocket, and then simply to Starship. Starship was designed by a company without those theoretical and completely imaginary unlimited funds of a government. 
They didn't sign insane contracts covering any and all expenses for subcontractors. SpaceX is a typically responsible business that wants to complete jobs economically, efficiently, and in a fixed time frame. They want to make a profit because they are a business. Building a multi-billion dollar single-use throwaway rocket doesn't make sense if there is any other way to do the job. You don't build a bus to take three people from New York to LA and then throw it away. By using an incremental approach, building prototype after prototype, and testing to the point of failure, SpaceX has made amazing progress in a very short time. And they've done it at one-tenth of the cost experienced by NASA by all the congressional restrictions. Build one and ask, does it work? Yes. So now, after functional design testing is complete, is the model useless? <laughs> nope. Deliberately overpressurize it beyond its design limits until you make it pop so you know what it is truly capable of. Take that into consideration as you build your next prototype. Saving the first one to put in a museum doesn't serve any purpose for development. If you want historical fame, build a spaceship that works reliably, safely, and earns you a place in history. How is Starship built? The shells. Originally, the Super Heavy Booster and Starship spacecraft, collectively also known as Starship, were set to be composed of aluminum-lithium alloy and carbon fiber because it was light, futuristic, and had excellent engineering properties. They tried it and then switched to stainless steel. Aluminum cans in a typical campfire will melt and deform at 660 degrees Celsius, and carbon fiber is equally vulnerable. Stainless steel melts at about 1400 degrees Celsius. By using stainless steel, the side not facing into the wind during re-entry is resistant enough not to need heat shielding at all, saving a lot of weight. The side that does experience direct re-entry heat needs thinner tiles based on how much the heat penetrates the tile and reaches the stainless steel. If it was aluminum or carbon fiber, those tiles would have to cover most of the ship and be much thicker. With SpaceX, practicality rules the development process. The engines. Engine development for SpaceX essentially started with Merlin and Kestrel rocket engines that ran on kerosene and liquid oxygen. The Kestrel is no longer manufactured. The Raptor engine now dominates in SpaceX designs. Raptor engines were designed to operate using cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen because it had smaller molecules in its exhaust and so didn't produce soot to contaminate the engine, making turnaround time faster. As well, it resulted in a higher specific impulse giving more power to the engines. Design configurations of these more powerful engines soon outstripped the proposed capabilities of the NASA SLS system. Additionally, since Musk's goal had always been a Mars landing, the fact that methane and oxygen can be manufactured on Mars in situ without much additional material was very important. Not having to take return fuel with you vastly increased the amount of cargo or the attainable speed of a Mars-bound ship. The Super Heavy Booster this portion of the vehicle can have even more engines than it's currently equipped with, useful for future development and larger loads. Currently, it has 37 and up to 42 Raptor engines, some of which are fixed and some of which can be steered. Most of the engines are atmospheric to get it into space, but the up to seven central units are vacuum engines designed to get maximum thrust outside of our atmosphere. It currently produces 72 mega newtons of thrust, which means it can lift 100 tons to low Earth orbit. It stands 68 meters tall and it's nine meters in diameter. Once its job is complete, it will detach from the Starship spacecraft and land back on Earth for its next flight, estimated to be capable of 1,000 reuses. The Starship spacecraft. This is the second stage of Starship with 1,000 cubic meters of space inside, or roughly 12 times larger than the volume of the ISS. There is an extension section that can make it even larger. It can be a long-duration habitat if needed, such as on a trip to Mars. SpaceX continues to develop the spacecraft with ideas to make it more useful. They should be reusable 12 times, but they can be permanently landed on the Moon or Mars, act as a habitat, be disassembled, and then turn into permanent structures on the surface. This is another reason stainless steel is better, since aluminum and carbon fiber don't lend themselves to reuse as easily. 
As currently configured, the spacecraft has six engines, three atmospheric and three vacuum engines. Once it reaches low Earth orbit, it can refuel in orbit and then deliver that payload to virtually anywhere, including the Moon, Mars, or wherever we need it to go. Variations For example, Musk has suggested that a variation called Mars Colonial Transporter, a revolving vehicle to generate artificial gravity, was on the drawing board. Long-duration space flights without gravity could leave astronauts weakened and unable to function, even in the lower gravity of Mars upon arrival. They'd be even worse off if they returned to Earth without gravity. Only partial gravity would be possible, but still useful for fitness purposes. The speed necessary for full Earth gravity would cause vertigo, so that should be avoided until we learn to make much larger diameter ships that could rotate more slowly. As it stands right now, SpaceX is handling about two-thirds of NASA's launches. They're cheaper than what NASA or other suppliers can provide. Lower costs mean more launches, which means more science can be done for the same cost. NASA scientists love SpaceX. If Starship turns out to be the major success everyone is expecting, Musk says launch costs will be $10 per kilogram. The $58,000 plus per kilogram of the SLS is looking absolutely ridiculous at this point. Sensible people are saying that SLS should be shut down and shelved the moment Starship is successful. This is particularly poignant when the price tag for SLS's single-use disposable rocket is based on one launch per year and not the monthly or more that SpaceX plans for Starship. There is no aspect of NASA's current plans that cannot be accomplished cheaper by a business rather than a government. SpaceX has the equipment, smarts, and innovative capability to handle NASA's needs. Its inventory of rockets can handle any known current manifest, and it would have gotten the James Webb Space Telescope launched years sooner if it had existed, because all the delays were caused by being obliged to fold the telescope to fit in the existing rocket. Should NASA rely on a single contractor to be the bus company to space? It doesn't have to, and there are many companies working on becoming space capitalists. However, maybe it should be for the time being, particularly when that company shows how much better it is when space transportation is run as a business, rather than a sly way for senators to get federal money into the economies of some influential states.